This is the American Law Journal. Do you have one of these? If not, you might not be voting in this year's presidential election in the state of Pennsylvania. From a trial court to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, back to the trial court again, the rights of Pennsylvania voters hang in the balance. Welcome to the program. I'm attorney Christopher Naughton. This is our 24th season on the air for the American Law Journal. Three guests weigh in on this controversy, the Pennsylvania voter ID litigation. We were supposed to have a fourth one join us. I'll get to that in just a moment. Gregory Harvey joins us this evening. He is not only a partner with Montgomery McCracken in Center City, Philadelphia, he also represents Vivette Applewhite. She is a plaintiff in the voter ID photo litigation matter in PA. Hank Gretzlack is the editor-in-chief with the Legal Intelligence Area, and he and his staff have been writing extensively on this issue. And the Honorable Edward Kahn graces us once again with his presence. He sat on the federal bench for decades. He was also the chief judge of the Eastern District and now is with Blank Rome. Well, we were supposed to have a fourth player on the program, and we just found out very recently that, unfortunately, he's a prominent attorney with a prominent law firm representing a very prominent client in this matter, and he did not gain approval. So he's not with us tonight. We always want to make sure we have our bases covered on this program. Unfortunately, he could not be here. For those in the know, you know who or what I'm talking about. If not, we have three compelling voices on the program tonight. We'll get the topic covered. Well, just last week, Gina Passarella, who's a senior staff writer with Hank's newspaper, The Legal Intelligencer, uh, sat down on our behalf with Jeffrey Tubin, who's the author and he's the legal analyst with CNN. And here's what he had to say about the Pennsylvania voter ID controversy. The Supreme Court has said already in a case from Indiana that it is constitutional to require a picture ID for voting. Um, what makes the Pennsylvania case more complicated and difficult is that the barriers that the Pennsylvania government established are even more than just a, a photo ID. Um, I don't think there's enough time for the United States Supreme Court to get involved. Uh, well, of course, the United States Supreme Court is not going to get involved in this issue for a multitude of reasons. But number one, Judge, They've made their decision. They, whether people ethically, morally, culturally, spiritually don't like the whole notion of a photo ID, the Supreme Court has spoken in 2008. It's Justice absolutely Stevens. legal. Yes. Justice Stevens. Justice Stevens. A fine justice and right. with a fine opinion. But just in case anyone's keeping score, it was not just the five conservative justices who voted for this voter ID law in Indiana back in 2008. As you said, Justice Stevens now retired from the bench quote unquote liberal, uh, did write the opinion. So, so, so Greg, as we look at this, the essence, or as I think the court says, the gravamen of the argument now is not so much about voter IDs and whether they're legal or not, but it's the time factor. The Supreme Court did uphold an Indiana statute, which is somewhat similar to the Pennsylvania statute, but that was in a case in which the lawyers challenging the statute had failed to find even one person in Indiana who could testify that he or she would not be able to vote. The case we're talking about involving the plaintiff Applewhite is a case in which a dozen people were found who could so testify and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania represented by the Attorney General stipulated that there was no evidence whatsoever of the type of voter fraud which would be prevented by having a photo ID requirement. Well apparently uh, the Republican view of this is that this ID, this voter ID law is not only constitutional, it's easy to get an ID, it should not be struck down. Here are some comments by Senator Toomey and Shannon Royer, the Pennsylvania Deputy Secretary of State. And so the law makes it easy for someone to get an ID. And if you don't have one on election day, you can still cast a provisional ballot and then demonstrate that you are who you say you are. The state government is setting up offices, has set up offices all over the state to allow someone to obtain a, uh, an ID for the purpose of voting at no charge whatsoever. So it's going to be easy for anybody who wants to to, uh, to vote, as it should be. The Judge Simpson in this case cited the U.S. Supreme Court decision from Indiana back in 2008 that found voter ID to be constitutional and a 
quite frankly, a common sense way in which to verify a voter's identity when voting. Uh, again, I'm optimistic that our voter ID law will be upheld. You know, it's interesting, Chris, you sort of touched on it at the start of the show, that the real issue here is the timing and it's the implementation. Um, if you read the state Supreme Court's uh, opinion the other week, both the per curiam and in both dissents, the running theme was sort of concern about the time, timeline. I think the majority referred to it as an ambitious timeline and also the implementation. And by all accounts, the law hasn't been implemented the way it was written, the way it was intended. So I think to whatever extent the, the law is in jeopardy of being, of being in effect come election time, it's going to be those two issues. Now, in terms of the future of voter ID, the one thing I've discussed with a couple people is that you know, both in the procurium and even in uh, Justice McCaffrey's dissent, there's sort of this notion that at some point, voter ID, in light of the U.S. Supreme Court's prior ruling, it's going to be the law of the land in Pennsylvania. I think really the issue right now is the timing this close to an election and the implementation. All six Supreme Court justices in Pennsylvania found a problem with the trial court. Let's, let's get that on the table. But two of them, the two dissenting votes, uh, felt that the Supreme Court should have taken hold of the situation and granted the injunction uh, right from the get-go. But here's what Justice McCaffrey said. While I have no argument with the requirement that all Pennsylvania voters at some reasonable point in the future will have to present photo identification before they may cast their ballots, it is clear to me that the reason for the urgency of implementing this Voter ID Act prior to the November 2012 election is purely political. That has been made abundantly clear by the House Majority Leader. And actually, many of us have seen this video, but let's go ahead and roll in Mike Terzai. We are focused on making sure that we meet our obligations that we've talked about for years. Pro-Second Amendment, the Castle Doctrine is done. First pro-life legislation, abortion facility regulations in 22 years, done. Voter ID, which is going to allow Governor Romney to win the state of Pennsylvania, done. Judge, are we here talking about this today if Mike Terzai doesn't make that statement, taking a legal matter and turning it political? As a practical matter, it was an unfortunate statement because I don't think it is a political issue uh, on the side of the Republicans. The history of uh, disenfranchisement is lengthy in this country. Starting in Pennsylvania uh, in colonial days, you needed a fifth, uh, 10 pounds or 50 acres to vote. In New Jersey, they have, still have the Board of Freeholders. You could only be a, a vote in New Jersey if you owned land, and you, there were property tests. Then there were uh, poll taxes, again, used to disenfranchise people, cumulative poll taxes. And then there was literacy tests, and the literacy tests, the literacy tests were um, imposed in an unfair way. And then there was the white primary. Now, it strikes me that if the Democratic Party wants to bring politics into that, they should look at their own history. Although, as we've discussed, too, uh, the parties kind of changed roles <laughs> back in the 1940s or so. And some of these poll taxes took place in the 1940s and before that. That's true. But again, the Republicans are the party of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Craig, I got, I got a little bit of a chuckle out of you, and I know you know the judge for many years. All the photo ID laws have been enacted with one exception in states which have a Republican legislature and a Republican governor. This is an effort, in my view, to limit, lower, uh, by a few percentage points, the Democratic vote and that's why Representative Terzai said it would allow Mitt Romney to carry the state. It is not plausible to believe that he was referring to some elimination of in-voter personation fraud as a result of Act 18, because the Commonwealth, in defending the law, stipulated that they had no evidence to show that if this act were not implemented at the general election, there would be any fraud. Let's take a look at John Stewart, add a little levity to this situation because he has his own unique view, and then we'll go right to Deborah Todd. And the state says it has no evidence to prove that, quote, in-person voter fraud is likely to occur in December 2012 in the absence of the photo ID law. It doesn't happen. This won't stop it. I think you can see why we have to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't happen, it won't stop it, and so you see why we have to do it right now. So uh, I think maybe, perhaps, uh, Deborah Todd, uh, you know, is, is somewhat in the school of John Stewart's thinking, because this is what she said also 
uh, a dissenter in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court matter. She said, 49 days before a presidential election, the question no longer is whether the Commonwealth can constitutionally implement this law, but whether it has constitutionally implemented it. The eyes of the nation are upon us, and this court has chosen to punt rather than act. I will have no part of it. Uh, Hank, uh, pretty strong words there. Absolutely. I mean, Justice Todd, I think, articulated a frustration that a lot of people had on the left. I mean, having said that, though, I don't necessarily agree with her point of view. I think um, what the court did is a lot of people were concerned that with uh, an evenly split court, you've got three Democrats, three Republicans, the seventh, uh, the seventh justice has been suspended. Um, a lot of people were worried that we we're going to have a split along party lines and what would that do for voter confidence. And by the court, you know, as I've reasoned with a couple of people, if it took this measure to send it back to the Commonwealth Court, if that's what was needed to sort of secure Republican votes, to have a four, a four member majority, then I think it was the right move. Um, it, no harm, no foul. I mean, it's, it's another layer of caution. Um, and I think they've really narrowed Judge Simpson's um, focus in this case. I mean, in fairness to Judge Simpson, he had to deal with a myriad of issues when it was argued before him. And now they're really focusing on you know, how's the law being implemented? Are people going to be disenfranchised? You know, so, you know, I think it was a strong dissent. I think Justice McCaffrey had a very strong dissent. And I think to some degree, in terms of always thinking in terms of public's confidence in the court and how the court handles it, the fact that they were so clear in their concern, um, Justice McCaffrey's, you know, sort of disgust with uh, uh, Mr. Terzai's comment, I think it was a good, it had a good effect. But to some degree, I don't think the court's punting here. I think it's just a layer of, I view it as a layer of caution a layer of fairness. Mm -hmm. And, you, you, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, just recently, again, Jeffrey Tubin was here in town, uh, Hank, and uh, one of the things he brought up was about Justice Roberts and that maybe he, he, he found uh, for Obamacare because he didn't want to see the court become just a political entity. You know, we had Bush v. Gore in 2000. We had Citizens United. Some people have opined, and tubin has been one of them, to say that occasionally judges need to know what the pulse of the electorate is about. Do you think that's part of what's going on here? I think maybe a little bit, but I also think to some degree the court is sensitive to the court itself, meaning that they're not necessarily worried about public opinion, but they were put in a tight spot here. And I think even the Republicans, particularly uh, Chief Justice Castile and um, Justice Thomas Saylor, who a lot of people, and myself included, think wrote the per curiam opinion, um, I think they're concerned about the position that the legislator really put them in here. I mean, you alluded to this too. I mean, if, if, if Terzai doesn't make those comments, if this was passed two years ago, I think we'd still see a challenge, but I don't know it would be quite the position the court was in now. So, um, you know, so I, I, think, I think public perception plays a little bit of a, a role in this. And to some degree, you know, courts sometimes, I think, are too oblivious to the concerns of the public. I think sometimes courts make decisions that show a disregard for what people think. And I think by, and that's something that was element in both the, the per curiam and both the sense, this concern for the, making sure that people had the right to vote. And that voter ID could potentially disenfranchise those who are most vulnerable. By articulating that, I mean, even if they ultimately goes back up to them and they, and they rule that the, the voter ID law can be in effect come this election cycle, I think it's important that the public hears that and then they express their concern. So to some degree, if they're being sensitive, I think it's a good thing for the court. Mm -hmm. But Judge, as the general public, should they be confident that you know something goes up to the Supreme Court and, and, and they fine tune it and they send it back to the trial court? I mean, the same judge is gonna hear, is gonna hear this matter. So he's, he's basically got new orders, if you will. The burden of proof have sh has shifted onto the state, correct? Correct. But should the public be confident that the same judge who heard it the first time and has certain predilections, uh, all six justices at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that the trial abused its discretion. Should the public be confident that a judge can now essentially reverse himself? We'll see. But the evidence will come forth in his courtroom, and I, th I have confidence that Judge Simpson will evaluate it fairly without political overtones. Mm -hmm. I will say that you know, I've been covering the state Supreme Court for 19 years, and this case has probably split people more than any other case I've ever seen. I mean, people that I consider fairly reasonable on the left have called it a poll tax. Um, I've heard uh, a number of Republicans that I'm very, um, very close to who have said that, you know, look, what's so hard about showing an ID? So it's been very split. It's been very, there's been a lot of political turmoil and, and, and a lot of politically tinged commentary on it. Having said that, though, the bar is going to be whether or not the state can prove that no one will be dis disenfranchised, and I think that's a pretty high bar. Well, coming up, could as many as one million 
Pennsylvania voters really be disenfranchised? What if you're not sure what to do if this new voter ID law is upheld? And what would Sandra Day O'Connor do? We'll be back in just a moment. I guess I have mixed feelings about this. Based on what I've read and what I've heard, on the one hand, it seems like this is uh, turning out to be quite a challenge, especially for low-income voters. On the other hand, I just heard something on NPR last night that were t where they were talking about it's actually easier to get an ID than many people think. So I think the jury is out for me at this point, uh, but I think it would be interesting, interesting to see what happens as a result. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller PC, a nationally recognized personal injury law firm protecting individuals against dangerous pharmaceutical medicine, including antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, defective products and medical devices, and other personal injury matters. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers. The photo ID controversy is is going to change uh, democracy, I think. I think it's a very important um, issue that needs to be settled in, in a long, long before we're at this stage in, in an election year. If voter ID laws are indeed affirmed in the state of Pennsylvania, will that disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of people? That's what some are claiming. Three guests with me this evening to discuss the matter. Greg Harvey represents Vivette Applewhite, who's the plaintiff in the voter ID photo litigation matter. Hank Gretzlack is the editor-in-chief with the Legal Intelligencer in Philadelphia, and the Honorable Edward Kahn has joined us on numerous occasions. Again, sat on the federal bench for decades, the former chief judge of the Eastern District. Let's listen to Vic Walchak, who's with the ACLU. He argued the case before the PA Supreme Court. But the inescapable point that's out there is that thus far since March, the state has only issued about 7,000 IDs to vote. And even the lowest estimate of people who don't have ID in the state, and this comes from the state, is 100,000. So come election day, um, it's going to be a mess. And that number could be as high as a million people here in Pennsylvania. Greg Harvey, I imagine you, you agree with uh, most of those numbers. I'm merely a small part of the team representing Applewhite. Uh, I haven't worked on those statistics, but there are a significant number, if it's even only hundreds of thousands, uh, who haven't been able to get it. And that's why the Supreme Court justices, whom I believe acted quite sincerely and in a bipartisan fashion, if you look at the justices who joined in the opinion sending it back, were moved uh, by the fact that the Commonwealth had to concede that the parts of the law that were intended to allow people easily to get a photo ID were not being complied with. Mm -hmm. And that's what the court explicitly held. And, and Judge, what do you think the state's going to have to prove now? Because they do have a higher burden. The burden has shifted over to them. So now Judge Simpson's going to be hearing from the state, and he's going to be saying to them, as opposed to uh, you know, the, the original, original appellants, tell me why we should be upholding this law. Uh, the state is going to have, the Commonwealth is going to have to introduce evidence in Judge Simpson's court that that's not correct, that the, that the Department of State has a, a hot telephone line that anybody can get the state's uh, ID, the Department of State's ID, which is not a Homeland Security issue, and that there's uh, uh, voting by absentee ballot, and there's also you can vote provisionally. So. They're going to focus on that at the hearing, right. and Judge Simpson will decide. And Hank, what do you think now that the burden has shifted to the state? I mean, that does change the stakes. I mean, it, you've now got to convince the court the same way that Applewhite had to convince the court. Doesn't that really shift the terrain? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, again, part of the, you know, people are sort of parsing over the language, but what the majority said in the procurium is that, um, you know, Judge Simpson has to find there'll be evidence of no disenfranchisement. And think about that. I mean, that's, you know, the no, you put, as in zero. As in, we're not well, saying Well, that's and that's what people that's what people are saying. People, some people are saying, well, that means zero, and other people are saying, well, of course they don't mean zero. So that's where the interpretation comes because in. Because even Judge Simpson, in his original opinion, if I if I'm correct, was was referring to minorities. Oh, it's only going to be a minority of voters, that sort of thing. 
as if that would pass muster, and maybe at that juncture it does, that argument's not going to pass muster now. No, no, and I mean, what the majority said, for the state Supreme Court said, is that, you know, in terms of the overall numbers, I think they were a little skeptical. I think they said that, you know, it would be a relatively small number, but they emphasized that it would be among the most vulnerable of society, mm -hmm. um, the elderly, the handicapped, veterans. So I, I don't financially think, disadvantaged, financially right. disadvantaged right, the right, poor. Right. So I don't think they're gonna, I don't think they're gonna tolerate uh, any kind of significant number. And significant could be a thousand. I don't think they're gonna go for that because I think, given the timeline and given the emphasis that both the majority and both dissenters said about the importance of the fundamental right of a person's right to vote in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. I think the bar is pretty high. I think the burden of proof is pretty high. Well, who was a Democrat who did not? go with Todd and McCaffrey in the dissent. That's Justice Bear, Justice okay. Max Bear. I mean, do you think that because the state's going to have this high threshold at this point in time, is there any way that you can predict that someone like a bear is not going to go over to the side of McCaffrey and Todd? And I know we're talking about politics now, and that probably, you know, gives the judge some indigestion. But, you know, just looking at the politics of this, wouldn't you almost have to predict that it's at least going to be a 3-3 vote, and then what happens? I think at best it's going to be that, but I don't think it's going to. I actually don't think it's going to come to that. Um, there are a number of people who believe that the Supreme Court was telegraphing to Simpson, um, "We don't want to deal with this now. Issue the injunction." Uh, I don't know if I quite buy into that, but I think that the, if you read between the lines of both the majority opinion and both dissents, I think that the court has made clear they don't like the timeline. They don't like the, the, the way that the law has been implemented. They're concerned about people being disenfranchised. They acknowledge that generally these laws have been upheld elsewhere. So I think, I think it's more likely, I'll go out on a limb, I think more likely whether it comes from Simpson or it comes from the Supreme Court, I, think you're, I do not think you're going to see voter ID implemented for this election cycle, but ultimately I think the law is going to be upheld in the right. long term. I'm in, I'm in your corner, uh, Hank, but uh, we, have, we have some really learned minds on the set here. Judge. What I really think? can't. Dis I would like to disagree with Hank, but I really can't. I think his analysis is correct. There's already two pe persons on the Supreme Court who have decided the case in favor of the plaintiffs. Uh, there's four left, and uh, the per curiam has uh, contained some statements that make me support Hank's statement. I mm -hmm. think the tea leaves suggest that there might be an injunction issued in this case, either by Judge Simpson or by the Supreme Court, but I hope not. Okay, because you really think it's going to, it maintains the integrity of the election. I, I think the, the tension here is between potential fraud and the problem, as Greg Harvey said earlier, is the Commonwealth uh, conceded that. I think the key reason for voter ID is to prevent voter fraud and to avoid the kind of taint that John Kennedy's election had in 1960 when the rumor was that John uh, Mayor Daley uh, gave Illinois to uh, Senator President Kennedy. But that was more, but, but wasn't that more, that, that's almost like the, the complaint you hear from the Democratic side of the ledger. Someone's getting in some of these Diebold machines and flipping 100,000 votes. We're talking about individuals walking into a voting booth and saying, I'm not the person I'm stating that I am, and I'm voting for the candidate, candidate you, of my choice. You heard the joke, voting often, right? But, Did you but, vote today, but, uh, Chris? <laughs> yes, often. Vote early and often yes. is what they say. But there's no. But even the state admits there's very little, if any, evidence of voter fraud in Not Pennsylvania. Not merely little evidence, zero evidence. That's what the Commonwealth stipulated to. And that's what makes this case so different. When the burden has been put in one instance, on a state to prove that a photo ID statute would not create voter disenfranchisement in Texas under a different standard because that was a Voting Rights Act case, Texas failed to carry that burden. I think that's what's going to happen here. But I also want to say that although the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania may have decided in some instances cases along partisan political lines, in my view, this is not that case. The opinion for the four justices who sent it back to Judge Simpson is, in my view, as nonpartisan 
a decision on a, an election issue mm -hmm. as I've seen in a long time. Right, and you'd agree with that, I Judge, agree with right? that, absolutely. Okay. So there's integrity in the system. There's some integrity here that it's not just drawn along political lines. So they're sending it back, but if I hear all three of my guests, what you're saying is you still think that perhaps in sending it back and the way they sent it back may be tipping their hands that, hey, voter ID, and, and, and Greg, you may not like this, voter ID will probably become a fact in Pennsylvania's history, but not before November 6, 2012. It's the rush to get it done before the November election against the background of the Terzai comment that this will allow Mitt Romney to win Pennsylvania that taints the whole process. But the decision of the Supreme Court was as nonpartisan as any I've ever seen on an election law issue. I want to thank my guests for joining me in this compelling conversation today. Greg Harvey with Montgomery McCracken representing Vivette Applewhite in the voter ID matter in the state of Pennsylvania. Hank Redslack, editor-in-chief with Legal Intelligencer, who has written on this topic and probably will be writing on this topic right until Election Day, and the Honorable Edward Kahn, again, seated on the federal bench for many years and bringing all those years of wisdom to our television program. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thank you for joining us this week. And until next week, case closed. If you care about this election, if you care about this election, if you have an opinion, if you want a voice, if you want a voice, if you want to make a difference, if you want to vote, then show it. Show it. Show it. Show it. To vote in Pennsylvania on Election Day, you need an acceptable photo ID with a valid expiration date. Learn more at 1877VotesPA or visit votespa.com. If you care about this country, it's time to. Tonight's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Scheller PC, a nationally recognized personal injury law firm protecting individuals against dangerous pharmaceutical medicine, including antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, defective products and medical devices, and other personal injury matters. And the Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.